Well, and welcome to this episode of Phil Talk Sports, where we bring up the latest and greatest in the world of sports. Today's episode, all about hockey, and I'm joined by the guy that knows that the most out of everybody I know, play-by-play announcer Nick Gimble. He's also the voice of Daytona Soccer Club, now Daytona Rush SC. He has uh, called games for clubs such as, Nor- as North- the Northfolk Admirals and Emory Riddle. Uh, Nick, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for getting up early. Yeah, Phil. Thanks for thanks for having me. I uh, I've done a couple of other recordings with one of our other acquaintances, Chance. Um, yeah, yeah, no chance. I actually recorded with him Monday morning, so it's all it's all fresh in my head. And uh, let's go ahead and get right into it, man. Right on, and shout out to Chance too. He's he's a good dude. I've I've enjoyed watching him uh, take off in his broadcast career at Daytona State. Also, uh, it's yeah. been fun. I usually work the the games that he's calling too, so it's 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 cool to hear him. So I think a great place to start would be, uh, you know, we've known each other as acquaintances for a while, and I always assumed if I had you on, it would be to talk soccer, and then the world kind of went crazy. So why don't you just let us know how you kind of got started in broadcasting, and I assumed you were a soccer announcer first, and I found out that wasn't the case. So how did all that come up with the Daytona Soccer Club, too? So the the very beginning was I, I was playing hockey for a, a at a high enough level for a team in, in my local area when I grew up in Virginia Beach. Uh, there was a team in Chesapeake about 15, 20 minutes away, worked up through their, their youth system, U16, made it to juniors for three years. And that's a high enough level where we bring in players from all over North America and a couple from all over the world. I had players in from Canada, Czech Republic, Russia, Slovakia, Slovenia. I, I had teammates from all over the world, so all their parents aren't local. So we had a, a live web stream service mm-hmm. for their parents to watch the games. And my second and third year playing, I kept asking my coaches, hey, I think this is kind of something that I want to do. Is there any way that I can hop on a mic for one of the other games? And I always got told, no, it's a very professional organization. Mm-hmm. They're like, no, finish up, finish up your games, be ready for your games, go home and rest. We... And then I was on the lower team, the higher team, they want, there was more exposure. Mm-hmm. So they had other people prepared, ready to do it. They didn't want me doing it for the first time. So my last year that I played, the next year when I wasn't playing, they said, hey, if this is something you want to do, go ahead and try it out for a preseason game. And, uh, and that was history there. That was my first game doing it. Everyone said I was doing great did the whole season for that, for the lower team that I used to play for. So I knew I had friends on the team. So it was real easy to learn the names and, and know the coaching staff and be able to talk about stuff like that. Um, and, and it's funny when I was younger, the reason I found out I wanted to be a broadcaster is I'd be watching a game with my parents. I would say something about, Hey, this is why this player made this pass instead of shooting it here. Two seconds later, the broadcaster on the TV said the same thing. Okay. And it would happen at least once a game. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to try to go for it and, and see what happens. Um, and then through that first team in Virginia that I broadcasted for, that league has teams all the way up in Boston and all the way down here in Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I made the decision to move down here with my fiance at the time, she's my wife now, we made that decision to move back down here to Florida. She has family here in Daytona. So I emailed all five teams in that league here in Florida and said, hey, this is who I am. This is what I want to do. Here's my resume. The team in Daytona responded in a week and said, hey, we heard your stuff. We played games against you guys. We got a spot for you. And then from that, moved down here, broadcasted for them, got in touch with Embry Riddle because they were in the same rink. It was nice and easy. Um, And then from from there, it was just branching out. Um, I'm working at Men's Warehouse now. Mm -hmm. And... I, I had a, I, we were doing prom rentals and one kid from like mainland high school plays on their varsity soccer team said, Hey, there's a, there's a new soccer team coming around. I, I think you should, you should give them a shout. Like, yeah, never really done soccer before. I've only done hockey. We'll, we'll see what happens. My, my in-laws came to visit. I told them what happened. They said, yeah, send, send them a Facebook message. Mm-hmm. I didn't know Kiyoki was running the, the Facebook stuff at the time. Right. So I, I, and they were such a fresh team. There were no, there was no contact info. Steve Hutchings was was not on the website. Kiyoki was not on the website. There was no coaching staff information to email. So I just sent a Facebook message to Daytona Soccer Club, and Kiyoki responded in like five minutes, say, "Hey, come around one o'clock today." I sent that message at like eleven, like, "Hey, come come see me in two hours," and then that was that. 
that's kind of reminds me of like how we started the supporters group for them. Cody had sent them a message and within like an hour, he's like, Hey, well, do you want to meet today? He's like, I didn't think we were going to get this far this soon, uh, but it definitely worked out that way. So just to backtrack a minute. So when you first asked your, your club and you were playing hockey about giving it a try, was it just let me give this a try? Or did you maybe think your playing career was like coming to an end and you wanted to do something that would keep you around the game? Was that already in your head when you asked that question the first time? When I asked it the first time, it, it was something that I knew I wanted to go to college for. The, the whole aspect of junior hockey is really specific to hockey itself. Mm -hmm. it, it's not high school. It's not college. It, it's like an in-between phase. So like players come out of high school. We can play up until we're 21 years old. So we have ages 19, 20, 21. You've got two and a half years in between high school and college. So you've got 21, 22-year-old freshmen going into college playing as a, as a freshman. So that's, that's what these schools are looking for. And if I was going to play at a higher level, it would have been through college. And I don't think I ever would have made pro. I didn't have that kind of skill level. But when I first asked that question, it was, hey, this is something I want to study. I think maybe when I'm done playing college, that'll be my, my career that I move into. I didn't realize that I was going to be stopping hockey as soon as I did. But luckily, I was able to pick up broadcasting quick enough with that team and, and find uh, different connections throughout the country. So it ended up being a smooth transition, even if that wasn't the plan initially? Yeah, I, I, I actually had, uh, I got accepted into George Mason University up in Northern Virginia. I was, I was told I had a spot on the team. But the, the thing with junior hockey, and especially that organization that I played for, like I said, very, very professional. We had practices Tuesday through Friday and a game Saturday, Sunday. I had Monday as my one day off. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the only kids on the team where that was my local team. I was in my own school system. I had my parents. I had my own friends. It's like all these other kids playing on this team, they're coming from out of the area. The only people they know in this area are the kids on, on the team. Right. So they're hanging around each other all the time. That's where those bonds and those friendships come from. Not saying I didn't make those friends, but I had other friends. I had my family. I had my own school to do. So I, I kind of knew at that time, like, okay, th this is a little bit of a different scenario for me. Uh, I'm not going to be gelling as much as w with this team. So I wasn't around the rink as much as they were. Gotcha. So when you got the call for, or the call back or the message back from Daytona Soccer Club at the time, you said you had never really done it before. Did you have the thought process that soccer plays similar to hockey and that you would pick it up soon? And what are the challenges and differences between calling both sports? Because I would assume they're similar, but different enough that uh, it does take a skill set to be able to do both. So I, I've been around soccer my entire life. There was an NPSL and a USL team in Virginia Beach that they're now the Virginia Beach United and VB City FC is the NPSL. They used to be the Hampton Roads and Virginia Beach Piranhas. Mm. So my and my my parents were always around. My dad actually did the public address announcing for them, and my mom was game day operations. So I was, a, I was around the team. I was around the sport uh, my entire life. Um, so it, it was an easy transition. I, I understood the rules. I understood the, the terminology. I, I did. If, I don't know if you caught it, if you watched the play-by-play -play back of that first game against um, the, that exhibition game. Right. I actually yeah. About the 65th sixth and, or the 70th minute in that time frame, made it the entire first half and the first half of the second half called the ball a puck in, in the 70th yeah. minute. So that was, that was a rough transition. Of course, my parents heard it. My, my wife heard it. I still hear about it to this day that I called the puck, the ball a puck. Um, I mean, if that's I, the it, only time, I think you can laugh. That is the that. only time at, when it mattered, when the season started, it's always been a ball. Did you call it a puck? Um, well, it was an exhibition game for you too. You were also warming up. So I think that's right. when you get to make those slip ups anyway. Right. And that, that game was my absolute first game doing any kind of play-by-play -play for a sport other than hockey. Not, not just doing soccer first time. That was my absolute first time doing any sport that was not on a sheet of ice. Um, well, for what it's worth, we all, you know, watched the games back, of course, and nobody would have thought, oh, this is this guy's first time. So I think we were all pretty yeah. impressed, uh, you I know, from the get-go. Yeah. But um, the, the biggest difficulty between hockey and soccer is the pace. Um, with, with hockey, if, if you listen to any of my calls, I like to always be talking. I don't want there to be dead air in mm -hmm. any point of the game because there's always something happening. 
Mm -hmm. the, there's a player always skating up the ice. There's always passes happening. It's a smaller, confined area. There's boards. There's more physicality. It's, it's the fastest game out there, in my opinion. But for soccer, and especially as we have the MLS is back tournament, I've been watching that a whole lot more, watching Orlando City go on their run. I, I've noticed that there's a lot more into it about letting the play speak for itself. Yeah. There, there's a lot of dead air when these professional broadcasters are doing it for MLS, Premier League, and, and over in Europe. A, a whole lot of dead air letting, if there is a crowd, letting the chance of the crowd um, have their own voice, let the, let the pace of play dictate itself. Because that's that was my main issue the first two games that I did is I was trying to talk the entire time mm -hmm. and trying to find words for the for the same pass that was happening in the backfield waiting for the defenders to move the ball upfield. It was it, it was a struggle trying to find words for the entire ninety minute game at that kind of pace. But I feel like that's where my that's where my advantage is having that experience calling hockey. If you take a look back at all of my goal calls for Daytona and, and soccer, I feel like I call those goals like I would a hockey goal. Mm -hmm. I, I, I have the very descriptive, at least those final three plays, I'm able to talk the entire time because that's what I'm used to. Whereas I've got to let the play build up by itself and let it just have dead air, which I'm still working towards and being a little bit uncomfortable with. Right. We had a, we set up a soccer podcast for the club itself. It's kind of on hiatus because, you know, club operations are kind of not, they're doing fine, but there's no games to be played, obviously. But when we set up the intro, I remember we re reached out to you to use your calls on our intro. And I found like the, my two favorite ones. And I agree, they're very high energy, which isn't every goal in, in soccer. They're not all created equal. Some are tap -ins, some are 30 yard screamers outside of the box. But regardless of where it was, you made every goal you know, exciting. And, and I agree. I felt the little bit of, if I knew it at the time, I would assume that, yeah, that, that came from the hockey aspect of that. Um, so is that, I don't, I don't want to, you know, dig too much in this, but I, do you know, obviously there's no soccer this year. They're looking for next year. Or do you plan to return to Daytona uh, SC when they resume play next year? Or is Absolutely. that still up in the air? Uh, un until I get picked up by another professional team, um, like a double A hockey team, uh, my, my goal and plan is to stay in this area. My, I've got some family here. I'm actually going up in a couple of days to help move my mother-in-law down. So we've, we've built a nice little life here, um, finishing up Daytona State next semester. I've got Embry-Riddle hockey. I, I don't see a reason to leave until I get to that next level. There, there's about 80 to 90 professional teams, both uh, USL League One, USL Champions, and in, in minor league hockey that have my resume on hand. And it's all about just waiting around, waiting for the right opening to happen. There was a press release four days ago that the Cincinnati Cyclones broadcaster got taken up to be the, the NHL expansion team, Seattle Kraken broadcaster. Oh, wow. So I know there's an opening in Cincinnati. So I sent them an email. They replied saying the, the season's not starting until December 4th. So mm -hmm. they're taking their time with their search, but it's just about waiting around, hoping for the right the right thing, right thing to come around. But as of right now, I am planning to come back for next season for, for Daytona Rush. And, and who knows if they ever end up making it up the ranks, kind of like Orlando City did. Hopefully, mm -hmm. that'll be nice to to grow with the organization. There are hopes. I don't. I don't think I'm letting any cats out of the bag here. But I think twenty, the 2022 season, they're looking to move to USL one. So that still remains to be seen. But that is the goal. So yeah, moving up does seem to be the. Uh, the plan for them. And it sounds like you obviously after that first soccer season that you are confident enough that you, you would call other games You're reaching out to other clubs too. So like after that first year, you're, you're kind of like a dual threat doing like hockey and soccer. You're confident with both at this point. Very, I'm pretty confident with soccer. I was hoping to get this season to really narrow it down. The, the worst part for me is that Embry Riddle's hockey season really is only in the, in the fall semester. They have, 15, 20 games from August, September to like December, and then they have their winter break. Then they've only got four or five games before they go off to regionals, nationals, their divisional playoffs, so on and so forth. None of that is really at the Daytona Ice Arena. Right. And this schedule didn't work out for me in my day job. 
So I haven't been on a microphone broadcasting a game since December 15th. Mm. And now with the Daytona rush season being canceled and Embry-Riddle's hockey season being postponed until the spring semester in January, as of right now, I will not have a broadcast in the calendar year of 2020, which is par for the course, I would say, for, mm. for how this year has been going. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think that that's uh, unique to you. I think a lot of people, like, you know, I, the other Nick that I have on here often, a good friend of mine that lives out in California, he's used to doing, like, University of San Diego and other things, numerous sports, same thing. He doesn't foresee having a, any sort of broadcasting, you know, gig for the next year. So, I mean, it's definitely been a transition for a lot of us. Like, I, as I'm someone who I work in all aspects of sports besides broadcasting at this point. And, of course, all those gigs have been – wiped out also um so about Emory Riddle I think I know the answer to this but just to fill in other people is that considered a club team is that like how UCF has hockey but it's not on the same level as like a scholarship sport is it still a club team at Emory Riddle or is that your normal scholarship athlete for hockey over there so it, it's absolutely club level um ACHA division three and actually UCF and Emory Riddle have a heated rivalry. They play each other right. multiple times. Um, it, American Collegiate Hockey Association, I believe, is what ACHA stands for. But it, it's basically the lowest level of club you can get. Division three. There, there's no scholarships. Players have to pay dues to pay for buses, hotels, ice time. The the rink doesn't give the team free ice time. They have to practice at like five, six in the morning mm. to be able to get practice times and before classes and it's cheaper at 6 a.m. than at 9 or 10 p.m. Right. So they're they're up early, working hard, getting getting ready, and they had they had a record year this year. They they would have made it. They made it to nationals. They beat the University of South Florida, I believe, three to one in the championship game of, of regionals. So Embry Riddle made it to the national tournament before it was canceled because of the virus. Mm. So that, that's the best season that this team has ever had. They're, they're bringing in recruits to play hockey rather than trying to pull Embry-Riddle students. Hey, you want to you wanna try to play some ice hockey with us? Yeah. They, they were bringing in freshman rookies from Texas, from California, from Wisconsin, from New Jersey that are stud players. And it's all because they've, they've had the success last year and now this year. They're going to have a, a pretty good team coming up in, in January. Uh, yeah, I've actually followed – I can't say I've been to one of those games, and I always want to because it is right here in Daytona. They play a lot of them, especially against UCF, which I'm a fan of, of course. But that same uh, division seems to have, like, Miami in it and stuff. So, like, other big-name schools, at least the logo itself, that people would know. Um, so I have wanted to get down there. Same with, like, a Solar Bear game, for example. Like, I've yet to get to one of those. I'm kind of a novice when it comes to hockey. But I always compare it to – this has always been my analogy, whether it's good or not – to me, hockey is always that cool coworker that you want to hang out with outside of work, but it just never happens, even though you actually do think the person's cool and want to hang out. I usually watch, like, playoffs and stuff. I think you get that from a lot of people. Same with baseball, you know, heats up in the playoffs. But I've been loving the NHL since it's returned here in the bubble. What have been your thoughts uh, so far as the presentation, the level of play? We had a five-overtime game last night with Tampa Bay getting the win. Um, so have you felt about the NHL since it's returned? I – I might be a little bit biased in saying this, but I, I think the NHL has been second to none in its return to play. The, the presentation, rather than having the, the cardboard cutouts that the MLB is doing, they created a state. They, they put tarps over the lower bowl of the seats. They created five extra jumbotrons so that way when, when play is happening at stoppages, there's extra presentation boards for cameras to pan to and, and there's different videos and different graphics playing and the the team the Toronto and Edmonton hub cities are really doing a good job of making the teams feel at home the each team was allowed to bring three or four sound bites for specific scenarios if, if you watch a game every single time a team scores there's their specific goal horn the, the lightning coils, the Tesla coils for the Tampa Bay Lightning play every single time that they score. Mm -hmm. they, they have their goal song playing after they score. Um, and it, it's so safe since, 
since a week before teams went to the bubble, they've done probably 3,000, 3,500 tests, zero positive cases, yeah. which, which is the reason that both the NBA and the NHL are successful. And that's why the, the MLS was successful up until last night. Right. They, they finished there. I believe their season's going to start in a couple of days here. Yeah. I think it's the this weekend, essentially. So they get a few days to like get back that. home. Yeah. Um, but the, the level of play has not dropped at all. If anything, it's been more competitive than past seasons because everyone's had the three months to reset. All these teams that had star in star players get season ending injuries had a chance to recover, recuperate, heal up. And now every single team has a stacked roster uh, of their best players. And we saw that with Chicago knocking off Edmonton. And we saw that with Montreal knocking off Pittsburgh. Right. The number five seed out of the Western and Eastern Conference, technically the number one seed in the qualifying round on both sides, got eliminated because they didn't take Montreal or Chicago seriously. And I don't know how you can not take Chicago seriously when you've got Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane, Duncan Keith, Brent Seabrook, and Corey Crawford. They, they've all won three Stanley Cups right. together. Yeah, as they're, long as that core group is together. There. Yeah, as long as the core is together, you can't really take a group like that lightly. And then did you catch any of that five overtime game yesterday? I was watching the MLS Cup final, but I was also keeping tabs on that at the time. So it, it was a three o'clock start time. I didn't get off work till seven. I was kind of watching the score a little bit. Mm -hmm. I saw that it, it was tied up a little bit going into the third period and going into overtime. Okay, overtime. Th this will be over soon. Sure. Okay, second overtime. This game's getting a little long. Okay, it's still in the still in overtime. I'll watch it on my way home. <laughs> Start of third overtime. I'm like, I wonder if Boston and Carolina are going to get to play because that's the other specific thing that's happening this year. Right. Is that you've only got one sheet of ice to work with. Yeah, on each. It, it's company. not like yeah. It, it's kind of like how the MLS is back tournament is where they only had that one game pitch. Mm -hmm. all, all the cameras were set up around that one set of field. Mm -hmm. So if a game ran late, which it very rarely does in soccer, um, but for, for playoffs in hockey, you go until there's a winner. Yeah. And we saw that last night that I, it was a six and a half hour game. I believe it ended at nine twenty five with a three o'clock puck drop. Yeah. And it was, and it was all on a broken play. I mean, you had these goaltenders play four and a half periods without giving up a goal. And then a shot from the blue line by Tampa hit one of the Columbus players up high night near the face, stunned him, fell right on the stick of their star player, Nikita Kucherov, and he fired it, beating Corpus Allo over, over the shoulder. Stunned him, the goaltender. He wasn't prepared for it. Right. But that's the kind of bounces you need to win hockey games, let alone five overtimes. Each overtime period, I assume it's not the same as like a normal period length, right? Or, or is it? It's, it's the exact same. The, it's a 20-minute period. So they There's essentially no, played two full games yesterday. Though, yeah, they, they played yeah. two and a half full games. Um, so what, what hurts for the goaltenders is they don't get credit for a shutout like they normally would for not letting up a goal in three periods. Right. But they two to two at the after, after three periods, stayed two to two after six, and then or after, yeah, in that fifth overtime, they because you've got one, two, three, four, five overtimes. So in that in that eighth period of play, you're, and the the presentation of the NHL, again, second to none, they've got all these video boards, like I said, they're, they're thanking their fans in the stands, and someone's got dad jokes because they panned to four industrial-sized fans in the crowd, <laughs> um, and then someone put up on the video board, we apologize if you had other plans tonight, still over time, so little, little jokes here and there just to make the game more human in my I, opinion i saw Rather one a lot of places like you know please leave safely and clean up your area they did that but it was please get yeah. safely off your couch and clean up your living room i thought that was the, funny. the wave is strictly prohibited at this game stuff like that so yeah. there in my opinion that makes it more human trying to add a level of humor in mm -hmm. these kind of tense situations because you're on, kind of like how you said you'll turn on a game if it's playoffs but this early in playoffs it's it's really just hockey specific fans and team specific fans that are watching games like Tampa and Columbus. Right. You live here in Florida. So we're watching the Tampa Bay lightning play. So right, exactly. with, with that, you probably wouldn't put on Colorado versus Arizona. 
like yeah. I would. I'm, yeah. I'm a fan of the Colorado Avalanche. Like I've always I, considered I, I'm yeah. a default. Like I'm a default Flyers fan just because I am an Eagles fan or this side Eagles fan and Phillies fan. So I always kind of went with them. I do have a soft spot for the Islanders. My entire family's from Long Island, so I do tend to watch them. And then Tampa. So there, there's reasons you watch who you watch, but rarely do you just put on a random game. Whereas, like, in the NFL, we'll watch Cleveland versus the Jets just because it's on, because that's how people view football. If football's on, they're watching. Things like baseball, right. things like hockey, it's definitely more regionalized. You'll watch your team. Maybe you have a secondary team. But usually this early on, this is, you know, what you would do. But like you said, everyone's kind of eating up everything because we finally have sports back. And what's, what's interesting for me from where I grew up in, in Virginia Beach, right, it's like 10 miles away from Norfolk, the biggest military installation yeah, in, in I had a America. best friend from high Got school. All, all, five branches, all five branches of military supported in, in that one Hampton Roads area. So we, we have a minor league hockey team, the Norfolk Admirals, which you mentioned that I broadcasted six or seven games for as a fill-in basis. Mm -hmm. That's where I got my start um, professionally doing those six games down here in, in Florida back in 2019. Um, but we had um, that minor league team at the time was one level below the NHL in the American Hockey League. They were a feeder system for the Chicago Blackhawks. So teams that I just mentioned, like Chicago and Tampa, Duncan Keith, Brent Seabrook, Corey Crawford, all of them, I have their minor league rookie cards mm -hmm. because they played for my team. I have pictures with Dustin Bufflin, the star for the Winnipeg Jets. Um, Craig Anderson, the goaltender for the Ottawa Senators. He played for the Norfolk Admirals. I have pictures with him from when I was five, six, seven years old. Wow. And with, with Tampa, John Cooper, the head coach, Tyler Johnson, Alex Killorn, um, play, players like that that were playing for the Norfolk Admirals when they were affiliated with Tampa Bay. They, and I think they mentioned it on the, on the broadcast last night where the Norfolk Admirals in 2011, 2012, when they won the championship, when they won the Calder Cup, they had the 28 consecutive wins. They, they broke a North American professional hockey record, not just the American Hockey League, but in all of North American professional hockey, that is the longest active winning streak. And I was able to watch those types of players play at that minor league level, get called up to, to Tampa Bay. And so especially living here now, going to some Lightning games, I have a soft spot for the Lightning, soft spot for, sure. for Chicago. Anytime I see a former Admiral player that I that I know I watched for a significant amount of time, I'll cheer for them. But my parents brainwashed me from birth, man. I, I was born in 96, right when the Colorado Avalanche won their first Stanley Cup. Mm -hmm. They're from Colorado, so it, it's just all fallen into place there. So I'm I'm Avalanche, Rockies, Broncos, Nuggets, all, all Colorado-based for me, even though I've only been to Colorado two times. Makes sense. I, I've had a similar thing as far as following uh, players that have lower level working for the Daytona Tortugas, a handful of guys, even this year, have been called up to the Reds. And because of that, the Reds are also kind of like my second team there. But like Tyler Stevenson was a starting catcher uh, the first year I started working there, got called up this year, hit a home run and it's the first pitch he saw for this year. So that was pretty cool. So yeah, getting to see these players, uh, you know, from the minor league level, either working for them or even just being a fan of them. Like when the Cubs won the World Series, I think they had 12 former Daytona Cubs on that roster. So even though, you know, Chicago was partying, Daytona had a little thing to celebrate too. So it is cool to follow uh, guys on that level. Uh, so we're in like the first round of the of the playoffs now for the NHL. The round robin thing happened. The Flyers look good in that from what I was watching. Uh, like I said, I watch the Islanders a lot. Um, from your, you know, as with the analyst hat on, who do you, who would you say is the favorites and who do you think is kind of pretending to be a favorite uh, as we start to wrap up here, who, who would you, if you had to put money on someone, who do you put it on this year? So if I had to put money on someone, it, it would be Vegas. Okay. Um, they're the number one seed coming out of the Western Conference. They went into the round robin number two. Um, they're going to have their hands full with Chicago. Vegas won four to one in game one last night. Um, Really, I realistically, I think all of the four round robin teams in the Western Conference have a solid chance to move on. Um, I think it was Calgary that got the upper hand on Dallas last night. Uh, it may have been Vancouver versus St. Louis last night. Let me check here. No, it was it was uh, Calgary winning three to two over Dallas. So the the number three seed out of the round robin is already down one nothing in the series. 
But what's interesting between the qualifying round and now, that qualifying round was only a best of five. Right. As opposed to a normal best of seven. Which I do think was a good call, though, to shorten that first round. I think that was that absolutely. Was a good move. And the, the other reason they did that, not a lot of people put uh, correlation to this, but with the round robin that, uh, like you mentioned, Philadelphia went 3-0 and the round robin. Mm-hmm. They were the number four seed out of the Eastern Conference. Now they're the top seed, so they have the right to play um, Montreal instead of having to play Carolina, like Boston does. Um, four teams in the round robin yields three games per team, which is the minimum allowed for a best of five series. Right. So everyone goes into the, the first round of the playoffs on a technically level playing field for amount of games played. Now, for Toronto and Columbus, that's the only series that went five games. Mm -hmm. And it went into overtime in game four. Columbus has played a lot of hockey, let alone going into five overtimes against Tampa Bay last year. Exactly, right. So I I think that the round-robin teams are going to be at a slight disadvantage just because they the round-robin games weren't as meaningful. Right. It was one game against each of the other three teams. So you don't have the, the rivalry. You don't have the grittiness that playing a team three, four, five times in a row gives. Right. Um, and we saw that yesterday with Calgary beating Dallas. Dallas was one and two in the round robin. They came out sluggish. And Calgary, who beat Winnipeg 3-1 in the series, they came out and got a one nothing lead in a best of seven series. That's easily able to be turned around. But getting that jump is, is what everyone needs. Um, I really don't think that there is any pretenders right now. I think, I think this is the one year where, I mean, you hear it all the time. As If you make it to the playoffs, you have a chance. Sure. We yeah. saw it in, I believe it was 2012, when it was the Los Angeles Kings winning this, their first Stanley Cup as the number eight seed. Mm-hmm in the Western Conference. They were the number 16 seed out of the entire playoffs. So uh, it, it is true that anyone can win as long as you make it to the playoffs. But what's, what's specific about this year as opposed to past years, and I said it before, is that three-month playoff period. Everyone had a chance to recover. Everyone had a chance to recuperate. So you're not going into playoffs as beaten and banged up as you would normally be. That's so you've true. got the top fresh teams – playing against each other, top line against top line, very minimal injuries, very minimal setbacks per team. I, I don't really see any team that is pretending uh, right now. Because you, like I said before, even Chicago, the number 15 seed right now, only in front of Montreal, Chicago still has Taves, Kane, Keith, Seabro. Their core group is still together. And right. with Montreal against your Flyers, you watch Carey Price, the Montreal Canadiens goaltender. Watch how solid he's playing after getting a confidence boost from knocking off Pittsburgh. If if Philadelphia can't get past Montreal, if they, if Philadelphia can't get past their goaltending, it's going to be a hard seven game series for the Flyers. And they're the number one seed coming out of the East. That's just how tight it is. Yeah. And we saw it against the Lightning. They're the number two seed out of the Eastern Conference. Columbus, they, technically they should be the most tired team out there playing five games instead of four or three like everybody else. They were able to hold Tampa to a five overtime like we keep saying over and over again, but it's worth bringing up to, to keep a team like the Tampa Bay Lightning in check like that. So I, I seriously think that this is anyone's year, but the, the style of play that Vegas plays the, and just the Western Conference in general, if you look at the Eastern Conference and, and even the Flyers, there's no more Broad Street bullies. Yeah. There, there's not as much physicality as there used to be in the Eastern Conference. The big bad Bruins aren't so big and bad anymore. The, the New York Islanders went on a, on a four Stanley Cup run in like five or six years in the, in the 70s and 80s because of how intimidating they were. Yeah. You can't do that in the Eastern Conference now. There, there's room for players like Tyler Johnson of the Tampa Bay Lightning Five foot eight, buck ninety, he, mm-hmm. but because he's got the speed and the skill, he is changing the game. Players that didn't have the stature or size before are now becoming stars. Like Marty St. Louis used to be for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Yeah, yeah that's no, Tyler no, no, no. Johnson models his game after, and rightfully so. It's it's successful for him. 
but for teams like Vegas, like for St. Louis, like for Colorado and Arizona out of the Western Conference, they play a mean physical style of game. And that's why St. Louis won the Stanley Cup in seven games last year against Boston. St. Louis came out. They wanted the puck more than Boston did. They played more physical. And that's I, I, that's why I see Vegas taking it all the way. They, they play that need-to-win physical style of game that, that you have to play to make it through and get 16 wins to, to win the Stanley Cup. And it all comes from really being an expansion team as well. Right. Because at – at that time in 2018, or I believe it was 2017 when the, when the expansion draft happened for Vegas, and we're going to see it again next year for Seattle, Seattle yeah. the, the players get an immediate bonding experience being, hey, my team didn't want me anymore. That kind of sucks. Oh, this brand new team wants me? That gives me a really good feeling. And yeah. then, of, of course, I, I mentioned this on Chance's broadcast or a podcast too, the, the horrible tragedy that happened October 1st, 2017 in Vegas. It, it, the, the horrible mass shooting that happened out there. I don't think Vegas would have been success, as successful as they were if that didn't happen because of how they came together to help rebuild the community. The Der, Derek Engelin, the captain for Vegas, homegrown from Nevada, from Las Vegas, mm -hmm. was able to come out, really bring the community together, was really solid and able to give a nice little pregame ceremony speech. And Vegas went on a tear in their first 15, 20 games, made it all the way to the finals against the Capitals. So I, I think the same thing is going to happen with Seattle next year or in two years as well, mm. that if they follow the same model that Vegas had, we're going to have two very strong extra teams in Vegas and Seattle coming out of the Western Conference. Because we have seen other, in, even in other sports, like a uh, tragedy happen and the team kind of rally the community. I think of like the Saints after Katrina and things like that, of course. Um, but you mentioned, I think the best thing about the NHL right now is because everybody's rested, every team is at full strength. There's really no nagging injuries because everyone had three months off. Uh, you're seeing the same thing with the NBA. Other than the player, the handful of players that opted out, everyone, you know, it's, it's full guns of blazing. So even if one's a one seed and one's a five C, like you're at least at full strength. So, of course, everybody gets, um, you know, gets a, a fighting chance because you are at full strength. One last question as we uh, get out of here. Are you familiar with the show Letter Kenny? I am, yes. Okay. How much of that is true when it comes to hockey players? I know that the creators of the show are former hockey players at, like, a junior level, like you've discussed. Is it, is it accurate on any description? It, it is and it isn't. Obvi obviously, it's portrayed to an extra extent, extent sure. for the humor, mm -hmm. but the the chewing tobacco, the dip, the 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 lingo, the the jargon that Letterkenny uses, and it 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 is accurate to an extent. I, I can't say that it's inaccurate to. Mm -hmm. it, it's so accurate to that extent. I can't say it's inaccurate. It, it is overplayed a little bit. Sure. But there are times where certain quotes will come out. The, the especially Jonesy, the the character Jonesy, yeah. the the kind of the chirping that they do back and forth happens all the time. It's it's hilarious and it, it is overplayed to an extent, but not to a point where it's wrong. And do, it, you, it, do you think it, it's gotten more in real hockey, ironically, because of the show? Because I could see that being the case. Like, do people yeah. do you, like does do they take from the show and the show take from reality at the same time? Yeah, so a lot of shows are going to play off of real life events. There, you you don't just make some random stuff up most of the time. There there are some creative minds that are able to do that, but mm -hmm. most of the time those kind of scenarios are portrayed from real life events, twisted a little bit to to add some humor. Sure. But the the chirping that goes on uh, uh, between the main characters is is pretty true, and the the small town junior hockey kind of. Um, redneck vibe that they give off is 100% true. I, I know teammates that I could pick in place to, to be any character. <laughs> well, that, I, I, that's exactly the answer I wanted. I knew it wasn't going to be like a one for one, but I'm glad it is definitely, you know, accurate as far as the world of hockey. Well, Nick, I can't thank you enough for getting up early and, and doing this. As we get out of here, let everyone know what's your social media. How can we keep tabs on you as you grow your career? So Twitter and Facebook are the two that I'm most on when it comes to my broadcasting. That's where I have the, the most following. I've, I've mainly got just closer friends on Instagram. I try, 
like growing up in Virginia Beach, I tend not to bore them with with the hockey stuff. But mm -hmm. uh, I've created the Twitter account to be mainly just my my hockey, and that's what I'm going to use to build my profession. But search search my name on YouTube. I I don't know if you saw it because I don't think Kiyoki ever posted it or Daytona Rush ever posted it. But go check it out. Just search my name on YouTube, and you'll see my demo reel and a little hype video that I made for for Daytona Rush. I actually I, found I, it through your YouTube channel at some point, so it is there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, search me on there, and uh, hopefully the the connections with the professional teams up up in the central United States with the East Coast Hockey League and all and all that. Hopefully, you'll see me at some point, professional hockey, professional soccer, whatever it may be. Well, yeah, we hope to see you on those levels. And in the meantime, hopefully we get at least another season uh, with you here for uh, Daytona Rush. That'd be that'd be good to see, too. Uh, thank you guys for watching. As always, follow me on Twitter at Phil Talk Sports. Let us know what you thought of this episode. Subscribe on YouTube or your podcast platform of choice. Thank you guys for watching. See you next time.